Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Professor Yarnir Baryam, who is the founder and president of the New England Complex Systems Institute, or NEXI, which is a think tank that studies society and the way scientists study nature. NEXI is using mathematics, computation, and other quantitative methods to address questions once considered to be outside the reach of science, including human behavior, social interactions, and the consequences of policies and decisions for our society. Yanir Baryam, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. John, it's good to be here. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible audience, Yanir, tends to be relatively senior national security leaders, government policymakers, researchers, and corporate leaders. And this also includes NATO and other allies of the United States. Our audience is interested to hear discussions which explore all aspects of information-related and cognitive challenges that face the free world. How would you introduce complex systems to this audience? So the main um, challenge that we face when people think about complex systems is they realize that there are a lot, a lot of things going on. There are a lot of dimensions. There are a lot of um, uh, uh, details that one might want to know about a system, including um, in a social context, you know, what a nation is doing, what their interactions are with the outside world, what their internal economic and social and political and you know, demographic and so on details are. The really key to, um, to thinking about complex systems effectively from a methodological perspective is realizing that you can never describe all of the details. And because you can never describe all of the details, the first and most important challenge is to figure out what's actually important in controlling and in, in, in the behavior of a system. So the, um, the challenge has been that the traditional scientific methods that are based in calculus and statistics um, are not adequate for describing complex systems. And instead there is a mathematical strategy uh, that was developed in physics in the study of phase transitions that enables you to start by identifying what are the variables that really matter. Um, and and that's, the that's the approach that I've been using over a few decades to develop an understanding of these highly complex systems, including social and economic and, um, and other systems, including biological systems, um, uh, so that we can make progress. It's like knowing that uh, it, it's more than just knowing sort of the variables are because people think that science is kind of about prediction, but really it should be about how do we control these systems. Uh, so if you think about, for example, a car, it's really helpful to know that the gas and brakes and steering and gear shift are the things that control the behavior of the car. Uh, otherwise, you, you wouldn't know where to start in thinking about the problem. Thanks, that was helpful. Artificial intelligence has famously experienced AI winters after realized gains did not meet expectations, but then compute power and other technological advancements enabled AI to rebound after years of significantly less investment. Has complex system science or complexity science experienced any kind of similar trajectory? So complex system science is maybe a little bit more sort of involved because there are many different domains, right? We had um, an explosion of interest in network representations, which started about the mm -hmm. year 2000. And that's continued and grown. There are thousands of people who are involved in network analyses of various kinds. Um, and, then, and then there are um, other domains uh, now there's been a lot of interest in urban science. There's been a lot of in, which is a topical area as opposed to a methodological area as much. Um, 
So I, I think that uh, yes, there are, are are different pieces that come online at different times, but there's a lot of them, and and so the the uh, adoption and acceptance of various aspects of complex system science or complexity science is growing. Great. I heard you speak in another forum, and you made the point that complexity science can help us ask the right questions. Could could you unpack that a little bit for us? Yes. So. Um, one of the uh, challenges in dealing as, as I, you know, with complex systems is really even recognizing what the right variables are, what the right dimensions, what the right, so, so that translates also into framing of the question. Um, and in many ways, um, when we think about complex systems, what we see is that there are these collective behaviors of the system and in traditional statistical thinking, you ignore collective behaviors, you average over them. So without recognizing that though collective behaviors are really important to understand and the way they fit into the, you know, the objectives that we have in thinking about the system, we don't even know what the right questions are. So starting with a framework that has the right basic concepts uh, also guides what the questions that we want to address are. Does time play a fundamental role in complexity science yes. in, a, in, in a way that it might not in other analysis disciplines? Yeah, I mean, we see very often, you know, for example, economics takes an equilibrium view of things. So it typically has a very static or steady state, more correctly, view of the world. Um, and, and doesn't have a dynamical view. But even when you do a dynamics, you know, complexity science includes nonlinear dynamics. So it's, it's, it includes not just sort of simple dynamical processes, but dynamical processes that can be quite elaborate in some sense, but include uh, what for traditional mathematics is, is, uh, can be bizarre behaviors like chaotic behavior, um, with uh, attractors and you know what are called strange attractors and all kinds of things. So the point is that incorporating dynamics into our thinking about the behavior of systems is intrinsic in a complex systems view. And depending upon what field you come from, it can be quite foreign for the uh, analyses that are being done. I'd like to try to walk our conversation towards the concept of emergence, which is uh, one of the uh, key concepts with complex systems. Would you mind if I ask you some, some uh, about some of the other concepts which are applicable uh, to complex systems and might make for an interesting discussion along the way? Sure, I mean, among the concepts are understanding interdependence. When one piece over here depends on the behavior over there, um, really it's hard to appreciate how little statistics describes about the behaviors of systems and that statistics is the framework uh, for most of our scientific uh, understanding of the world. Um, and even artificial intelligence is based upon statistical assumptions. Uh, and so the, the, the tremendous advances that are being made now in AI are still quite limited in their scope of description of how we understand the world. So there's a lot of room to grow in that space. Um, and um, uh, I don't know if you want me to go straight into emergence, but basically emergence is about understanding the nature of uh, dependencies at the level of collective behaviors of the system. And so if we have something like a panic, like a market panic or a fad or other behaviors, whether they're economic behaviors of social behaviors, um, we don't have in traditional calculus and statistics, the right tools for describing them. We can say, hey, I think that was a panic, but to describe the way that it arose and how its dynamic behaviors uh, emerged from the underlying interactions of the system over time or emerged in the sense of the emergence, meaning the, the relationship between the fine scale local behaviors and the large scale collective behaviors. Uh, 
Um, that's absent in traditional uh, mathematical methods. Uh, and it, it's astounding to say this because so much of our world uh, is really about those collective behaviors, um, but they really have to be described within the context of a complex systems uh, mathematical framework in order for us to capture them. I see. Uh, would it be too much of an oversimplification to say that complex systems are literally everything? That it, well, I mean, like everything can be described in complex yeah. systems terms. I mean, from yeah. from from a from a cell to a universe. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is that when I usually go through a course on this subject. I explain what are the things that are missing from calculus and statistics. And all of a sudden you step back and you say, well, the only system that we can really describe in statistics is a system of independent components or, or a system where all of the components are completely dependent on each other. And then you say, well, everything else is a complex system, which is of course, everything that we care about. Um, so it's really astounding that we've made as much progress as we have in understanding the world. but. Again, the reason is that statistic captures certain aspects of a system. And, and that's really powerful and important and not to be denied. But if we wanna go beyond those uh, uh, specific properties of a system, we really need much better uh, and more comprehensive mathematical tools. Uh, and the other part of it is that those mathematical tools are linked to concepts, ideas, uh, that are important in how we think about the world. Uh, and that's super important for everything that we do, not just the scientific mathematical description, but indeed how we um, interact with the world overall. How does energy and entropy uh, factor into a basic understanding of complex systems? Uh, the domain where complex systems became clear in physics is in the domain of materials where energy and entropy are really important. Entropy, um, so, so energy, we kind of understand as a collective of the sum of the energies of components of the system and the interactions between mm -hmm. the components. Mm -hmm. um, entropy is this really strange beast which is related to a very subtle concept, which is the space of possibilities. How many possibilities are there for the system to be in? Um, and, and the measure of entropy uh, is, the, is, the, is a count of the number of possibilities that they are, there are. Uh, strictly, it's the logarithm of that number, but it's the number and it has physical meaning in terms of the behaviors of system. It turns out that the generalization of entropy uh, is mathematically what we should call complexity, but it has to do also with the scale dependence of that quantity. So how many possibilities are there at a micro scale is very different from how many possibilities there are at a macro scale. And it's the macro scale uh, entropy at different scales which enables us to characterize the complexity of a system. In a sense, and in a very uh, important sense, that is characterizing what are the variables or dimensions that we need to describe the system. And so if we wanna grasp a hold of a description of a system, whether it's a society or a biological entity, uh, we need to know what to describe. And that's what the complexity is and it's very closely linked to the definition of information that was developed by Shannon, which is exactly the same quantity. Uh, it's the logarithm of the count of the set of possibilities in a message that we can transmit. So all of these ideas of information, complexity and entropy are really kind of the same thing, looking at them from slightly different perspectives. That is fascinating. Yeah, so I wanted to take a little uh, detour on this. So we, we've had on the uh, podcast some uh, folks that have talked about uh, the uh, Russian brand of information warfare, uh, which includes uh, what's been called the fire hose of falsehood. Uh, 
which is a essentially a technique of just throwing all kinds of uh, junk. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter, uh, but it's intended to distract and confuse and, uh, uh, you know, sow that kind of discontent into our uh, discourse. And um, I'm curious whether you could think of that in terms of uh, energy and, and entropy in that it takes a lot of energy to maintain order, it seems. And it takes relatively little energy to destroy something which has already been built. So yes. could, could, could you think about that Russian fire hose of falsehood technique as a relatively easy way to disrupt what would otherwise be a, a more orderly discourse. So it, it, it's like an entropy inducing uh, methodology. Would that be a, a fair way to look at that? Yes. Let me give it a little bit more color, if you will. Yeah, sure. So there's a law that is um, an important one to know about, and that's called Ashby's law of requisite variety. Hmm. Basically what Ashby's law says is that every system has a certain complexity internal complexity. Um, and that complexity um, enables it to respond to its environment. So there's a limit to what every system can respond to, which is the relationship between the complexity of the system and the complexity of the environment. And when the environment is highly complex, the system will fail in dealing with a task that's associated with that information. So you can imagine a super high powered video game, right? Or you can imagine indeed the confusion that people face in dealing with tasks at work or in, at home that have to do with very high complexity. Very simple environments are boring. Very complex environments are overwhelming. So that creates a framework for thinking about this information warfare strategy of overwhelming an individual with uh, too much information. And in fact, that is the challenge of the world that we're in today, where the cacophony and the tremendous amount of information makes it difficult for individuals and organizations to identify what's important and unimportant and to respond to their environment effectively. And so there has to be a mechanism by which that information gets limited. And, and that translates very often into um, frames that reject information that is needed in favor of information that is uh, confounding. Um, and so, and, and examples of that are ideologies Ideologies are ways of simplifying the world to enable an individual to, quote, cope, uh, but by misrepresenting the nature of reality, uh, they uh, uh, cause individuals and groups of individuals to be ineffective in their response to the environment. Um, and I wanted to, maybe I can at this point, talk a little bit about the challenge of the current situation, because Sure. Yeah. There is a, this challenge of the cacophony is one piece of the challenge that we've been facing and dealing with the biggest challenge in recent years, which is the decade, the, the pandemic, even in decades. Uh, the pandemic has really undermined the U.S.'s ability to respond effectively to a major challenge, but it's not the pandemic that has been the real challenge. Indeed, as we see, it is the cacophony of voices and the inability to identify the right message, the right information for response. And, and I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about this uh, in what may seem like not a, a scientific aspect, but really is, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, complexity science takes many things that are previously considered not to be in the domain of science, in particular quantitative science, and makes it possible to analyze them. Mm 
And the thing that I wanted to point to uh, more than anything else is how what has been exposed is the vulnerability of our system to undermining its values. Hmm. And, and I think we can understand this in a very direct way. And I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about it. And okay. values are individual values, but they're really emergent properties of the system. They have to do with the interactions among people and the shared understanding of reality, uh, which arises from those interactions. And the vulnerability of the system that has arisen is in some sense, um, a, a affected by what you've talked about, which is the externally driven cacophony, which is not just a cacophony, but has directed elements to it. Right, yeah. And, and so understanding sort of what those directed elements are doing is super important. And, and I wanted to point out how um, we know fundamentally from the most basic statement about the United States, but it can be applied to any system, um, that the values of the system are the strength of the system and that undermining those values is the strategic way to undermine the strength of the system. And it goes back to united we stand. And I want to get to that statement through a discussion of how the values of our system have become apparent to be undermined uh, through the response to the pandemic. Right, you said a lot just then. Do complex systems methodologies have some, something to contribute to the problem of uh, identifying the deliberate signals within the, as you were saying, the cacophony of, of, of junk to um, understand how to parse that out. Because from the perspective of, a, of an analyst or of, a, of an AI trying to look at this, it's all just one big mass of information. How do you separate out the intentional uh, information from what would just be the, the, the junk information? So the baseline here is indeed that complexity science can do exactly that. And the example that I used about the car and knowing about, you know, the steering wheel and the brakes and the gas and, you know, the, the, the shift as being the essential controllers of what you do with a car, as opposed to say, you know, lying on the ground and trying to rotate the tire or opening up the trunk and sitting in the back seat, you know, um, if you knew what are the right variables, then you would know how to learn how to drive a car. And, and that's the, the complexity science can do that for pandemics. And so we know what it's needed in order to control pandemics. There are a few important variables. One is the R, right? The transmission rate. Another one is travel, travel from place to place. And a third is the discreteness of the variables. So it says that we can eliminate the virus by getting to zero. And in particular, if we combine these things. So you can't drive a car without combining the steering and the gas and the brakes and the, and the shift. Uh, so you need to know how to work them together. And if we think about it, we can put together a, a method for controlling the pandemic and we can do that. And it's been demonstrated to be possible. It was demonstrated by China at the beginning. It was demonstrated by South Korea. It was demonstrated by New Zealand and Australia and, and other countries, some of which have, are now in bigger trouble than they were originally. But there is a method to doing this. But the problem has been in much of the world that that has not been applied. In fact, there has been a conviction that it can't be done. And that's not a scientific statement. I can assure you that it's not a scientific statement. So where did that come from? And, and that's where we get to the information cacophony. And where did the, uh, our, our understanding get undermined? And, and that's what I wanna talk about. So, so on one hand, we have to have this real recognition that complexity science can tell us that we can control pandemics, we can eliminate them. 
Um, and then there's this other piece where society has failed to do so. And the US, of course, with a huge number of deaths and huge number of people who have been infected has been a very bad performer in this context. Surely not what we would have expected given our pride uh, in the US's ability to deal with crises and other things. So I wanna walk through that and I know we have limited time. So I'll do it quickly. Sure, sure. And I'll say it and then maybe sometime there'll be another opportunity for discussion about how this can be done in this context and other contexts. But what I wanted to do is to say that values turn out to be the greatest vulnerability of a society. And I said mm. that before, and yeah. I think that that's super important. And in the pandemic, there are two different values that I want to point to. One is the value of life, right? There's then this statement that, hey, it doesn't matter. So old people will die and, and you know, sick people will die. And so who, what do we care? And that's such a bizarre statement given the values that the United States has upheld for hundreds of years. And so one has to ask, why did that show up hmm. uh, in this context? It's an alien value system, really, in the context of what we knew and were proud of as the values of the United States. The second thing, which you know, is perhaps even more surprising, is the can't do attitude. We can't do that. Where did that come from in the ethics and value systems of the United States? The United States always prided itself on being a can-do society. And yet across the pandemic, in the Western, in the free world, in very great contrast to China and other countries, including New Zealand and Australia, it was the United States and the Western powers that said, we can't do that. And some of the irony of it is that it was exactly the fact that China did do that, where we said, hey, we're not a dictatorship, we can't do that, which is incredibly surprising because if it's something that you can do, in order to be successful, you would expect that the United States would recognize the importance of action and execute on a plan to achieve the outcome that was desired. Right. So I think we have to ask serious question about how did the value system of the US get undermined? And then there's the third one, which fed into the other ones which is the internal division, the absence of the united we stand, the idea that we can't do something because of the internal conflict in the society. And how did we get to the realization or the belief that because we can't, because of the fact that we're fighting each other, uh, we can't do something that would save all of us. That's a pretty strong and not very intuitive uh, narrative. And yet it has been the dominant narrative across this pandemic. So if we take those three things, the value, the diminishing of the value of the life that can't do and the internal division where does it come from? And the answer is, I would like to suggest that it comes from three different places. And it represents fundamentally a vulnerability of our system. And when there is a vulnerability, there will always arise something that will exploit that vulnerability. And the first aspect of the vulnerability is actually something that we're very proud of, and that's our free press. Remember, every weak strength is also a weakness. And unless we recognize the bounds of what is that strength um, and the role of, of, um, of balance, uh, we may have our strengths create our weaknesses and manifest in that way. And part of the function of the press is to inform the public 
But the press as an institution is not unbiased. It has a very strong bias to one thing, and that's attracting attention. Mm-hmm. And one of the best ways to attract attention is to point to controversy and division. And by amplifying division, the press has created a narrative of internal division that doesn't survive scrutiny. In other words, if you, under, if you do polls of the country during the pandemic, the vast majority of people wanted to stop the pandemic, wanted to take actions that would prevent transmission. And there are polls that will show this. You can look them up. There is a 50 states poll. How did we get to the point where we believed that the controversy and the division in the country was the most important narrative? And the answer is that that was a narrative that was promoted by the press as a means of creating controversy. And that's super unfortunate. The second uh, statement, the second vulnerability, which again is something that we pride ourselves tremendously on is the economic system. The economic system that values financial advancement, that values um, uh, wealth uh, and does not intrinsically as a first order statement value human life. And what happened is that with the narrative that there was a pandemic and that it was diff- impossible to eliminate it, which remember is counter to scientific analyses, the idea of a trade-off between economy and health became the accepted dogma. And in that context, business and the business community, economic powers pushed to ignore the health implications of opening, of eliminating restrictions and allowing the disease to spread in the population despite its tremendous impacts on health. Ironically, that action causes the most harm economically as well. It's the biggest damage to business. It's the biggest damage to the economy. Those countries, that valued life, those countries that believed that elimination was possible and took the strongest action were the countries that had the least economic impact. So it is is a false narrative that there is a trade-off between economy and health, but its acceptance led to businesses pushing for the wrong outcome, for the wrong direction, diminishing the value of life, which we said was a key part, and using the controversy between those who want to open up and those who prefer to close down as a means of advancing short-term economic interest rather than long-term and fundamentally the right economic benefits. So once again, we have this a strength, right? The tremendous strength of the United States and other Western powers and economy um, under these circumstances became a weakness rather than a strength, undermining our ability to respond effectively to the pandemic and to achieve the best outcomes, both in terms of health and in terms of economy. So those were two, the press and economic strength. But the third one, is clearly the foreign powers issue that this group is so much concerned with. Because what would be the best thing to do in the context of a pandemic for a power that would like to undermine the strength of the Western alliance and the Western world and the United States in particular? And the answer is obvious. Do everything or anything to reduce the effectiveness of the response to the pandemic. The pandemic if you are an opponent, is your friend. And so by creating um, pandemic, let's call them COVID friendly policies in the Western countries, one can best harm, harm both economics and health of those powers. And to say that is obvious is, trivial. So we've had these um, multiple 
um, failures and very much showing that the statement that we know uh, we have met the enemy and he is us, right? Uh, when yeah. we have info warfare actions, we have met the enemy and he is us because it is our own values, our own desires that can be misled and figuring out how to deal with that uh, is a great challenge to our system uh, and to the very structure and way of life that we would like to uh, uh, promote. So this is not a political podcast, but it's very challenging to talk about this particular subject because this is live in our social discourse right now. I would just like to verify, Yanir, that these are not political observations on, on your part. These are scientific observations that you and your colleagues have made, correct? Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that there is a description of, of conflict in the U.S. as the dominant narrative about what's going on is not questioned. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that's not actually what's going on in the system uh, is observable scientifically. People mm -hmm. are much more united and can be much more united. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's not, remember it from an information warfare perspective. If we flip it around, we know that we can appeal to the best in people as much as we can appeal to the worst in people. And when there is a military leader that talks to his troops in traditional context or in modern context, the most important thing is to appeal to the best and not to the worst. And in an info warfare, you want to appeal to the worst. And if you want to see what happened in the United States over the last years, the last couple of years, what we've seen is an appeal to the worst. And I'm not talking about any political entity. I'm not talking about any other, um, mm -hmm. any other discourse. This is just what has been observed we have an appeal to the worst in people, which is itself the undermining of the values of our, our people and promoting values that are themselves undermining the integrity of our system. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts about some kind of like a, a killer app, which is needed these days uh, where complexity science is uh, a foundational component of, of developing the app. Yeah, the main thing is that we need to develop the human side of our system in a direction where we have a network. The, the point is the following. The way we recognize the value of life of others is from the value of those that we are closest to. And by, by thinking clearly about how we interact with the people that are near us, we can extend the social network to be one which is a positive valued system rather than a negative valued system. So the crucial killer app is the building of networks of people globally mm -hmm. who care about each other, right? Because they are close to each other. And you see how we're walking back and forth between what normally is a mathematical description of a network, but we can incorporate the affective, the values part of the understanding because we know that people care about the people who are close to them. And it is that network of, let's call it compassion, which is the right word for it, which will enable us to truly combat the disinformation that we are being faced with, which is an alienating uh, process. And to say that again is clear. By talking about people far away, we alienate ourselves from our fellow man. But by talking about people that are close to us and extending our network through them, uh, we have the opportunity to establish 
a, a, a compassionate system that cares about human life uh, and that can respond effectively. This point about the can do versus the can't do, that's the super important piece of this. So what do we need to be able to do in order to be able to do the can do? And the answer is that we have to understand that together we can do some things, many things that we cannot do separately. That's the collective behavior of complexity science, right? What can we do together? And to recognize that we can do things together. You know, I don't know if you've seen this, right? You get a bunch of people together and they can lift the car, right? Right. So you have to, if you haven't done it. You don't know that you can do that. The question is, why can you do it? And the answer is because together is very different from separately. And the empowering of people has to do with their recognition that there is an opportunity of collective action. And anyone who's been in the military knows this. And anyone who's run a business knows this. But we have to do that socially in a way that we haven't been doing in many years and in new ways that we've never done. And so the complexity science killer app also includes this idea that we need to find ways to empower collectives, in principle, all of society uh, to do things because that's the way we can do the most. And that, however, requires an understanding that we do it together which remember is counter to this idea that we are divided. So we have to get over the divided and recognize that we're doing things together and that will enable us uh, to defeat pandemics. When we fought the pandemic this year, we weren't fighting the pandemic, we were fighting our social institutions, we were fighting our narratives about ourselves uh, and that's what we have to overcome in order to be successful in the future. Right, right. And uh, I commend to our listeners, you, you have, Yanir, on your website, uh, something you call the Teams Manifesto, which I, I believe touches on some of these themes. Is that right? That's correct. Right. So everybody, for a, a deeper dive, uh, please go and check that out. And Yanir, you've given us a lot to think about. And with that, Professor Yanir Baryam, thank you so much for being on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.